I, it's a real honor for me to meet uh, our, our, our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Linda Colley is a um, uh, expert on British imperial and global history from 1700s on. She teaches at Princeton University. And um, uh, she's also entrusted me with the slides for her show. So as she put it, this one's all on me. So if there's a big screw up, um, don't blame her. It's on me. So I, you know, as well, you know, I have, um, I have the full, the full capability to make this a miserable night for all of us. So hopefully I won't screw this up. So uh, without further ado, would you welcome our speaker tonight, Linda Colley. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, let me first of all, uh, thank Mark for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, and let me emphatically thank all of you for listening in, for zooming in uh, on this sticky summer evening. Uh, well, at least it's sticky in New Jersey. After what I'm sure has already been uh, a lot of zooming on your part. This evening, I'm, I'm going to talk for about half an hour uh, and then open things up for any questions or comments you may have. Now, my latest book, which I'm talking about this evening, The Gun, The Ship and The Pen, which came out in March, charts and reappraises a major transformation in ideas, political practices, political organization and behavior, which eventually spread around the globe. Now in this country, the United States, when we think of the emergence of written constitutions, we immediately think of the great text drafted at the Philadelphia Convention over the summer of 1787 and published first of all in a Philadelphia newspaper on the 17th of September, 1787. All under the watchful eye of this man. And I wondered if we could have the first slide, if it works. Perhaps, perhaps not. Um, well, uh, what you should be seeing now, but I can't see it, perhaps you can, is a slide of George Washington, um, who presided over the Philadelphia Convention. And the particular slide, and perhaps you'll get to see it at some point, uh, is here we are, hooray. Um, this is based on a sculpture by the Italian sculptor Canova. Uh, and this was designed for one of the American states in the early 19th century. And of course it shows George Washington um, and look how it's representing him because this is something I'm going to be talking about. It's showing Washington as both a great general and as a legislator and constitution writer. Here he is as an ancient Roman general, but he's writing down the constitution as well. And that's a theme that the coming together of war making and constitution making that runs throughout my book. Note something else, however, what became the US federal constitution was not in fact the first new ambitious political constitution to emerge in the 18th century. We often think it is, but it wasn't. The year 1772, four years before the American Declaration of Independence, 
had seen the publication of what was known as the form of government, a revised constitution for Sweden, which had in fact begun experimenting with written constitutions in the 1710s. And this new Swedish constitution, the form of government of 1772, is explicitly a fundamental law to which all male Swedes, including the Swedish monarch, must swear allegiance. Uh, so it's very important. And there had been still earlier signs of change and development as regards written constitutions. In 1755, this man, and can we get on to the next slide perhaps? Well, um, I hope it will emerge soon. Um, show you um no no uh that's never mind uh what we were looking for was uh the man called pascal paoli um and perhaps he'll emerge later uh pascal paoli uh another soldier and in 1755 paoli uh and of course he he gives his name to a town in uh, on the east coast which is pronounced rather differently here but he drafts a new constitution for the mediterranean island of corsica uh, and this corsican constitution uh, which has really been pretty much neglected provided for the creation of an independent Corsican Republic. Uh, here we are, hooray, Pascal Pauli turns up. Um, here he is looking very tough in uh, a print made in 1768, when in fact he's about to be driven out of Corsica. Uh, but his constitution, which only lasts till 1768, which is partly why we don't know much about it, uh, not only created a Corsican Republic, but it gave the right to vote and the right to stand for election to all government posts to men, all men over the age of 25. Um, now, of course, you might say, well, hey, you know, constitutions are not really new, are they? Um, written or engraved codes of law and sets of political rules had after all emerged in parts of the world uh, ever since ancient times in Greece, in ancient Rome, but in other parts, for example, parts of what are now the Middle East, uh, you can find sets of rules of government orders uh, being either written down or often inscribed on stone. But these very ancient written or engraved codes of law are different from the written constitutions we take for granted now. Um, they're usually cobbled together by ruling potentates with no intake from anyone else. Um, they're not widely distributed uh, before print, how could they be? And anyway, in ancient times, hardly anyone could read. So they're very much um, But even when literacy begins to spread in parts of the world, even when the printing press spreads out of China into the West. Uh, these codes of law, for example, Magna Carta, the famous code of law and system of rule, um, they're not massively distributed, they're not widely known. Um, 
copies of them are not particularly correct. But from about 1750, give or take a few decades either way, but from about 1750, things begin to change. The rate at which single document texts, which are explicitly called constitutions, start emerging uh, increases all the time. By 1914 and the outbreak in Europe of the First World War, these kind of constitutions, written constitutions, single documents, mass produced, have spread into parts of every one of the world's continents. And therefore, of course, they're not confined to the West. Um, and can we have the next slide, Japan, uh, to give you an example? Well, again, let me describe what you're going to see, I hope. Um, it's a Japanese print commemorating, <clears throat> oh, we've got Mark instead, never mind. Um, here we are, wonderful. Uh, this beautifully colored Japanese print uh, created in 1889. Um, it's actually something of a work of the imagination, but it shows the promulgation of the first Japanese constitution in 1889, uh, a constitution that, that's going to endure until the end of the Second World War, when of course the Americans will replace it. Um, it's a very important constitution indeed, this Japanese constitution. It's not remotely democratic to begin with. Um, but what is important about it is that it endures, it's mass produced in different languages, in print, and it's very important for lots of Asian nationalists, uh, people who who see the success of this Japanese constitution as proof that this is no longer just a Western device. This is something that countries anywhere conceivably can think of doing. But why did this explosion of new kinds of written constitutions occur? Why did it happen? And with what results? Well, some of the factors are well known and I mention them in this book, as far as Europe and the Americas are concerned. The 18th century enlightenment undoubtedly fostered increased interest in systematizing government and writing it down, and a new cult of the legislator, uh, the person who writes the laws. Um, and one aspect of that in the mid 18th century is that you get a new cult of Moses, the figure in the Old Testament. Um, and you can see images of Moses coming out in lots more paintings, bits of architecture, books devoted to him. And, and Moses becomes the lawmaker's hero in a new way. Um, for example, George Washington, again, is sometimes called the American Moses. Uh, and this is part of the new cult of the lawmaker, the law writer. Yet, even though constitutions and lawmaking became so contagious after 1750, 
progressively so, these devices, written constitutions, have often looked at, been looked at only in regard to single countries. Um, and they're discussed often only in a spirit of, if you like, patriotic piety. Um, yet these devices, written constitutions, spread across barriers, they spread across frontiers, they spread across oceans. Um, and that's what I talk about in this book, not just constitutions within the space of a single nation, but as something that is increasingly spreading across nations and continents. And uh, the increasing spread that you see after 1750 uh, with patterns of war and violence. War, I argue in this book, though it's not the only influence, but war has often been the key from the 18th century right up to the present time in different ways. But, but why, you may say, after all, there's, there's always been wars, so why should warfare suddenly start in the 18th century having this impact, encouraging written constitutions? Well, partly because of the other factors that I've mentioned, like the Enlightenment, but partly too because by the mid 18th century, the nature of warfare in parts of the world is changing. You're getting much larger wars emerging and you're getting what I call hybrid wars becoming more common. What do I mean by hybrid wars in this context? I mean wars which involve large amounts of fighting on sea as well as fighting on land. Uh, and you can see examples of these big hybrid wars, there's a whole lot of them. Uh, perhaps the first one that, that is really important in constitutional terms is what Europeans call the Seven Years' War and Americans call the French and Indian War from the mid-1750s to the mid-1760s. Another example of this kind of huge hybrid war would be uh, the wars fought by Napoleon and his opponents in the 1790s and early 19th century. Uh, the First World War would be yet another example uh, and one could go on. So why does this shift in the nature of warfare towards, in many cases, bigger wars that are happening not just on land, but also on sea. Uh, really large scale expensive wars. Why? Why is that causing constitutions to emerge in new ways? Well, first, because these bigger and more recurrent wars put many states and the rulers of states under greater pressure. They now need to taxes to pay for these huge wars. And of course, they need to raise <clears throat> more men in order to fight these wars. So issuing new constitutions to act as a kind of political contract with the rule was one way that you could do this. And this is increasingly what happened. Um, and, and this was spotted by many people. I think of the great German sociologist, uh, Max Weber, um, 
And Max Weber puts it this way, and this is just after the First World War. He says this, military discipline, he writes, had helped bring about the triumph of democracy because states wished and were compelled to secure the cooperation of the masses and hence put arms and along with arms, political power into their hands. Now that's by no means all the answer, but it's part of it. And one of the things you notice increasingly is the way that political constitutions start stressing conscription. Uh, the French revolutionaries really start the ball rolling with this in the 1790s uh, and increasingly other powers are doing the same. This Japanese constitution that you see the picture of still on your screen of 1889, um, this provides for, for conscription too and it makes militia service compulsory for all Japanese males of a certain age. And you see similar trends in South America, in the Ottoman Empire, what is now Turkey, and so forth. Rising levels of bigger, more expensive wars often resulted too in the collapse and defeat of some powers and the emergence in their place of new powers. And these new states frequently found issuing and publishing a political constitution to be a valuable way of signaling their arrival on the world stage. Um, and could we see the next picture, which perhaps we saw earlier, the, the one of Haiti? I don't know if that can come up again. Well, when it, when it comes, uh, should show uh, it's a print celebrating the emergence of the first Haitian constitution in 1800, 1801. Um, the first constitution uh, to free black slaves explicitly, the first constitution in world history to create a black ruled constitutional state. Um, again, it's not a particularly, um, here we are, uh, a very celebratory constitution. Um, and in the middle is, uh, the great Haitian freedom fighter, Toussaint Louverture, uh, holding the constitution. And look at the imagery, and it's a reminder, I think, that while lots of constitutions are increasingly being produced, they're often very different from each other. If you think of the American founding fathers in 1787, they deliberately don't mention God at all in their draft constitution. They are men of the enlightenment, that some of them are deists. But Toussaint Louverture was a Catholic um, and uh, Catholic constitutions often mention God. Uh, this remains the case into the 20th century. Um, and it's a reminder that, okay, lots of powers are having constitutions, but they're, they're often different from each other. And looking at how these constitutions are the same, and how they differ is part of what I try to do in the book. Um, let's look at the next slide, because again, it gives us uh, an example of one more important constitution, the second oldest constitution in the world, 
the Norwegian constitution, which was drafted in 1814. But, um, and I hope we'll soon get um, this wonderful Victorian painting of the Norwegian founding fathers in 1814. Um, but again, if one looks at this Norwegian constitution, which is still in being, though it's been amended many times since 1814, you notice another difference that whereas the Americans uh, and the revolutionary French used constitutions to create republic, the Norwegian constitution of 1814, like many other constitutions in the 19th century, is to do with monarchy in part. Indeed, the word king is the most common word in this. Here we are, um, this uh, very wonderful painting. Uh, it's uh, an imaginary painting in part, though it's based on portraits of all the founding fathers in Norway, drafting this 1814 constitution. And notice how this fits the model. Notice how many of these people are in military uniform. Uh, again, this is associated with war. One of the reasons why these Norwegian guys are making the constitution is that they anticipate rightly that there will be an invasion from Sweden and they want to get uh, the constitution drafted, providing for Norwegian independence before that happens. Um, but even when a state is defeated, um, it may still get a new constitution, either as a way of re-legitimizing itself, or perhaps its conquerors and invaders will give it uh, a new constitution. And um, we see that happening after the Second World War. Um, the Allies create new constitutions for Japan uh, and for Germany and France, which has been invaded by the Nazis in order to reassert itself after the Second World War, creates its own new French constitution. The demands and burdens of rising warfare also nurture demands from below for a greater political say and greater rights. And I think this is very important. I've been talking about men of power, and it usually is men before 1914. Um, but war can also be a political education for those below, ordinary folk. Because when you think about it, regular wars means bigger taxation. It means your sons get drafted into the army, perhaps against their will or the Navy. It means your, your local businesses, your local village is disrupted. You can get really cross about this. You may be radicalized by wars uh, and say, look, we want more rights. We want to make sure our rulers don't do this again. Uh, and has often fed into new constitution making. However, and I talk a lot about this in The Gun, The Ship and The Pen, uh, yeah, we've got rising numbers of new constitutions after 1750, uh, increasingly moving outside the West. But not everybody benefits equally by any means, uh, often the reverse, precisely because uh, from the late 18th century, throughout the 19th century into the 20th, constitutions are often linked with wars and conscription. 
women are often squeezed out. Uh, very few states before 1914 enfranchise their women. Now, there's many reasons for that, but one reason is this feeling, well, if you want to encourage men to join the armed forces, you want to make sure they feel special, that they are citizens in a unique way. Uh, women are no use in war, many people think, so why should they have the vote? Why should constitutions incorporate them within the active citizenry. Um, and it really takes the First World War to persuade most powerful states that this should change. And that's partly because women, of course, show that they often can join the armed forces in some capacity. There's very few exceptions to this, um, though in my book, I talk about one of them. Uh, the first place to give women the vote on equal terms with men and for this to endure all women as well as all adult men is the tiny uh, island of Pitcairn in the South Pacific in 1838. Um, an extraordinary story. Um, I can go into it if you're interested. There's another way in which constitutions in the late 18th, 19th, into the 20th century often discriminate. Many of these wars are feeding into forms of empire. Um, and empires are often working against the interest of indigenous people into whose lands they are spreading. Uh, and you see the empire of the United States in the 19th century, and um, that's what many American leaders call it, an empire, um, which of course is spreading across the continent. Uh, into land uh, often claimed by indigenous people uh, who are often explicitly cut out by the new constitutions. Um, let me end with what tried to be an exception to this. Let, can we have the next slide, please? And here is a truly remarkable man. You may have seen this painting. It's a copy of an original painting. We've only got the copy now of Sequoia, uh, who is a mixed race Cherokee. Why is Sequoia special? Well, the Cherokee had been eroded in number by the early 19th century uh, and their lands increasingly um, exposed to white settlers. Uh, by the 1820s, uh, they're mainly confined to what becomes the state of Georgia. Um, and Sequoia is a very interesting man we still don't know as much about him as we would like. And he's important because he works out how to convert the Cherokee spoken language into writing. Uh, he creates what he calls his syllabary. Um, and here he is pointing to this Cherokee written language that he has created. And this written language devised by Sequoia enables the writing in 1827 of the Cherokee Constitution. Um, and could we see the next slide? Um, and I hope 
that we can see the opening page of this Cherokee constitution, uh, which was drafted and published in 1827. Um, and it's every page has two columns. One is in English, one is in Cherokee, the Cherokee written language devised by Sequoia. And this constitution is very carefully worked out. And it's worked out just Cherokee politicians, but also by white missionaries who support their survival. Um, and it, it claims, it asserts that the Cherokee, as you see, are a nation. Uh, with rights of permanence uh, and it explicitly sets out their boundaries, the boundaries the Cherokee want to claim in perpetuity uh, and says look this is it uh, and it sets it out in great detail up to that river, up to that hill, up to that mountain is Cherokee land forever, forever, forever. Um, it doesn't work alas, um, the Georgia legislature uh, declares this a non-starter. It says, you've got no right, you're all absorbed in Georgia, you have no rights at all. Um, and uh, the Georgia legislature is supported by the federal government in Washington. And in the mid 1830s, uh, what remain of the Cherokee are driven out of Georgia um, and a couple of thousand of them die in the process. So this is at one level, a deeply unhappy story. However, let me conclude by making two points. First, although this particular Cherokee initiative was defeated, it demonstrates the volatility and progressive spread of written constitutions. Once available in writing and in print, able to be translated to cross frontiers and to be ransacked for ideas by different groups and peoples, you couldn't really put a lid on constitutions. They kept spreading, even though this particular Native American constitution is defeated, you're getting many more emerging over the course of the 19th century and after. Leading on from this, while I seek in this book, to reappraise our understanding of these extraordinary devices and their spread across the world by linking them partly with patterns of warfare, changing warfare. This is in no way to deny the significance or importance of these devices. Um, emphatically not. Indeed, I leave you with this thought, something we may want to ponder now, perhaps particularly now, when populist and authoritarian regimes are on the rise in many regions of the world, is how exactly can these devices, written constitutions, be retooled and reinforced uh, so that they remain relevant and important and, and have traction. Because when you think about what's helped these devices to spread in the past, a lot of things have changed. I've talked about how important warfare was in spreading these kind of constitutions. But of course, the nature of warfare has changed. Uh, you won't get, hopefully, big hybrid wars happening in the future. 
you will get, of course, lots of civil wars. Uh, and you get lots of civil wars now in Africa, the Middle East, parts of Asia. Um, and again, civil wars are in those areas are feeding into new constitutions. <coughs> but for big powers like the United States, uh, and even smallish powers like the European states, um, the kind of big wars that forged constitutions in the past, hopefully they won't recur. So we've got to think about that. But there's a much bigger challenge, it seems to me. We now, many of us, inhabit a digital world where more and more people get such political information as they consume from multiple websites and different kinds of screens. So in this new world of digital technology, when people don't look at the written word on a page, but look at screens, what price the single document written political constitution? How can its special status be preserved and assured in a world where blizzards of political information and misinformation are so widely available on digital screens and other screens. Um, I use the, con the conclusion of my book, uh, The Gun, The Ship and The Pen, uh, to throw out some ideas about the present and the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Colley. And I just wanted to mention to people that it works so much better in rehearsal with the with, with those slides. I was, I was wrestling with my computer. Uh, um, question it was great. For you. It was great. Uh, yeah, you, you lie well. Um, question for you, as I'm listening to it, you know, the, clearly, you know, the probably the most famous constitution in world history is written in 1215, the Magna Carta. You come from a country that doesn't have a written constitution, and yet, uh, and, and yet, somehow England succeeds. Why? Why do the British not have a written constitution, and yet these other countries write it down? Because obviously, hmm. part of the constitution is showing who's in, who's out in terms of being a citizen. England survives without a written one. How does that work? Well, I again, I discuss that. I mean, Magna Carta is many things, and again, it, it's emerging out of uh, a war, a warlike situation. But it's not a constitution, not a constitution in the way we think of a political constitution. Um, it's not mass produced. There's no printing press at the time. Um, there still isn't a proper copy of Magna Carta available in print in the 18th century before the 1750s. So um, that's part of the answer. But the more important answer, the English do begin to experiment with what is closer to a political constitution in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, during the civil wars of the 1640s and 50s, they experiment with various documents. One actually put into law in 1653, the instrument of government, which is much closer to being a constitution. But um, the civil wars get overwhelmed, the monarchy comes back in 1660, and that fails. And I think what is, there are various reasons why Britain doesn't have a written constitution, but one is that um, it isn't successfully invaded, it doesn't have a revolution after 1688, um, there isn't a major civil war, uh, outside of Ireland. And so you don't get 
Britain is a very aggressive power, as of course people in America know, but the wars don't come into Britain itself in such a disruptive way that a new constitution is needed. What may change this is if Scotland becomes independent, uh, as it may do in the future. National Party has said already that if Scotland does secede and become independent, uh, they want there to be a Scottish written constitution. Um, if that happens, then um, what is left of the UK may feel obliged to create its own new constitution as well. But that's for the future. You mentioned Pitt Kern Island. Is that of the mutiny on the bounty fame? Is that where it comes That's that comes in? absolutely it. Yeah. Um, that, you know, this is a tiny place, really just a lump of rock, uh, where the bounty mutineers, as you say, the ones who survive, and their Tahitian um, friends, most of them women, uh, finally take refuge in the 1790s. And by the 1830s, there's about a hundred of these people uh, on Pitcairn, um, most of them of Tahitian ancestry because the white males die quite quickly. Um, and for various reasons in 1838, uh, these people, courtesy of a visiting Scottish Royal Naval officer who's very creative, acquire this written constitution, which endures up to the 1930s, which gives women the vote on the same basis as men. But as I say, we're only talking of a population of about 100 at that stage, but it is an extraordinary document. You mentioned about war, you mentioned obviously um, writing spreads things. Um, I think somebody you mentioned in your book was Napoleon, and he was certainly fascinated with constitutions. Uh, talk about him. Well, again, um, obviously a warmonger, um, but he's a warmonger, but Napoleon also likes to write. One of the things you find uh, about many of these people who are involved in constitutions early on is that they're interested in the written word in general terms. Um, and Napoleon is a classic example. When he's young, um, he tries his hand at all kinds of writing. He writes novels, he, or he tries to write novels. He tries writing history, um, all sorts of things. O obviously a man of good taste, therefore. Um, and he starts experimenting with written constitutions increasingly because as he establishes himself as ruler of France, ultimately emperor of the French, uh, as he begins to call himself, um, he, as he, he gives, um, many of these conquests, their own constitutions. Um, and he partly does this uh, because he has certain liberal ideas. He wants to get rid of discrimination against Jews, for example. Uh, he wants to get rid of certain aristocratic privileges. But there's another motive why he gives out so many of these constitutions, some of which he writes himself, he wants manpower uh, and all of these constitutions of conquest say uh, this new country I'm creating in Germany or Italy or Spain or whatever, um, I want this amount in taxation, I want this number of men. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of quid pro quo, you know, more rights, military service in return. Uh, he's a very extreme example of what you see in some other parts of the world. 
We've got a question here. Um, thank you for your wonderful book. I was surprised to read how many constitutions there have been and that so many have failed. What would you say is the average lifespan of a constitution other than the United States? Are they undermined more by external circumstances or from their own internal flaws? Um, the average lifespan of all the constitutions they, that have been formally issued, because there's a lot that fall on the wayside and they don't even get to promulgation, um, is actually pretty close to what Thomas Jefferson said was the ideal lifespan of a constitution, namely about 17 or 18 years. Jefferson felt that all constitutions should be rewritten after that because society changed. And why would you want to keep an out of date constitution? Um, not an idea which has caught on, obviously, in the United States. But um, that, in fact, is about the average historically across the world. Why do these things fail? Well, they don't, they don't always necessarily fail. It may just be in some cases that governments want to do things differently. Um, this happens a lot in South America which runs through an awful lot of constitutions in the 19th century. And it's often just assumed, well, this is because it was chaotic, inefficient, they couldn't get their act together. Well, that's true in some cases, but in other cases, governments are beginning to think, well, we tried a federal system with our previous constitution, we don't like it, change it work out another system, or they may say, again, we are fighting a new war with our neighbors. Um, we'd like to increase the number and the type of men who can vote uh, in return for conscription. Um, so let's enfranchise more indigenous people, uh, more freed black slaves. Um, so let's issue a new constitution to do that. So, in other words, very often the, the quick turnover of constitution does suggest that the regime is collapsed or being defeated or whatever, or it just doesn't work. But sometimes constitutions are, are changed because circumstances are changing and rulers want to play catch up. You also talk about the role that religion plays in this, be it the papacy, missionaries, uh, on down. Talk a little about that. Oh, I mean, I think religion, I mean, you know, of course, religion being one of the great human practices and emotions um, and ideals, uh, it's, it's going to be in constitutions, isn't it? There's differences, as I've already suggested, between Catholic constitutions and Protestant constitutions. Um, and of course, when Islamic powers start generating their constitutions and Buddhist powers, uh, you get differences again. But staying within Christianity, one of the ways that constitutions begin to spread into other parts of the world is through the influence of Christian missionaries. Because, uh, and you see this particularly in tiny islands in the Pacific, uh, like Tahiti, um, missionaries will come in, they will say, well, really what we, we must do, and all missionaries do this, we, you know, we'll bring a printing press with us so we can issue Bibles in the local language and prayer books and so forth. But once you've got a printing press in a society, then people begin to think, well, let's print other things too. Uh, and that happens in Tahiti, it happens in Hawaii, 
which produces a string of very interesting constitutions from 1840. Uh, and Hawaii, of course, is an independent uh, monarchical state until the 1890s. Um, and Hawaii starts producing its own political constitution in 40, using the printing machinery that missionaries have initially brought into their islands. And one of the motives that makes Haitian chiefs and the king do this is the feeling that if they issue Haitian constitution, sorry, Hawaiian constitutions, this may preserve their independence because they know that obviously there's a risk they're going to be taken over by a European power or they're going to get taken over by the United States, which of course in the end is what happens. But they think that if they can issue their own constitution, this will confirm, rather like the Cherokee, that they are an independent nation with the right to be left alone. Um, and, you know, uh, this is a pattern you can trace in, in different parts of the world. Well, thank you for taking the time for joining us tonight. This has been great. Uh, I, I greatly enjoyed this. I really learned a lot. Um, uh, I continued success with this book. Thank you so much. Um, uh, is what's next on the on the uh, docket for you? Do you have another project that you want to do? Um, well, I, I was I was hoping you wouldn't ask that because um, you know I'm I'm still in recovery mode. Um, I've got a, a year's study lead uh, coming up, um, so. Uh, in about a month or two, uh, I think the vague ideas I've got will have begun to solidify. But I'm I'm treating myself, as I say, to a recovery pause at the moment. Okay. Well, I'll let you recover. I, I withdraw the question, counselor. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you very much for doing this tonight. Uh, continued success with this book, and um, and 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 enjoy your uh, and enjoy your 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 time off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you, those of you who've been listening. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, thank you, everybody. Good, good night. Stay safe.